Chapter six to nine of First Love. Chapter six. The whole evening and the following day I spent in a sort of dejected apathy. I remember I tried to work and took up Keidanov, but the boldly printed lines and pages of the famous textbook passed before my eyes in vain. I read ten times over the words, Julius Caesar was distinguished by warlike courage. I did not understand anything and threw the book aside. Before dinner time I pomaded myself once more, and once more put on my tailcoat and necktie. What's that for? my mother demanded. You're not a student yet, and God knows whether you'll get through the examination. And you've not long had a new jacket. You can't throw it away. There will be visitors, I murmured almost in despair. What nonsense! Fine visitors, indeed! I had to submit. I changed my tailcoat for my jacket, but I did not take off the necktie. The princess and her daughter made their appearance half an hour before dinner-time. The old lady had put on, in addition to the green dress with which I was already acquainted, a yellow shawl, and an old-fashioned cap adorned with flame-coloured ribbons. She began talking at once about her money difficulties, sighing, complaining of her poverty, and imploring assistance. But she made herself at home. She took snuff as noisily, and fidgeted and lolled about in her chair as freely as ever. It never seemed to have struck her that she was a princess. Zinaida, on the other hand, was rigid, almost haughty in her demeanour, every inch a princess. There was a cold immobility and dignity in her face. I should not have recognised it. I should not have known her smiles, her glances, though I thought her exquisite in this new aspect, too. She wore a light barège dress with pale blue flowers on it. Her hair fell in long curls down her cheek, in the English fashion. This style went well with the cold expression of her face. My father sat beside her during dinner, and entertained his neighbour with the finished and serene courtesy peculiar to him. He glanced at her from time to time, and she glanced at him, but so strangely, almost with hostility. Their conversation was carried on in French. I was surprised, I remember, at the purity of Zinaida's accent. The princess, while we were at table, as before, made no ceremony. She ate a great deal, and praised the dishes. My mother was obviously bored by her, and answered her with a sort of weary indifference. My father faintly frowned now and then. My mother did not like Zinaida either. A conceited minx, she said next day. And fancy, what has she to be conceited about, avec sa mine de grisette? It's clear you have never seen any grisette, my father observed to her. Thank God I haven't. Thank God, to be sure. Only how can you form an opinion of them, then? To me, Zinaida had paid no attention whatever. Soon after dinner the princess got up to go. I shall rely on your kind offices, Maria Nikolaevna and Piotr Vasilyevich," she said in a doleful sing-song to my mother and father. I've no help for it. There were days, but they are over. Here I am an excellency, and a poor honour it is, with nothing to eat. My father made her a respectful bow, and escorted her to the door of the hall. I was standing there in my short jacket, staring at the floor, like a man under sentence of death. Zinaida's treatment of me had crushed me utterly. What was my astonishment, when as she passed me, she whispered quickly with her former kind expression in her eyes, "'Come to see us at eight, do you hear? Be sure!' I simply threw up my hands, but already she was gone flinging a white scarf over her head. Chapter 7 
At eight o'clock precisely, in my tail-coat and with my hair brushed up into a tuft on my head, I entered the passage of the lodge where the princess lived. The old servant looked crossly at me, and got up unwillingly from his bench. There was a sound of merry voices in the drawing-room. I opened the door and fell back in amazement. In the middle of the room was the young princess, standing on a chair, holding a man's hat in front of her. Round the chair crowded some half a dozen men. They were trying to put their hands into the hat, while she held it above their heads, shaking it violently. On seeing me she cried, "'Stay, stay another guest, he must have a ticket too!' and leaping lightly down from the chair she took me by the cuff of my coat. "'Come along,' she said. "'Why are you standing still? Monsieur, let me make you acquainted. This is Monsieur Voldemar, the son of our neighbour. And this,' she went on, addressing me, and indicating her guests in turn, "'Count Malevsky, Dr. Lushin, Meidanov the poet, the retired Captain Nirmatsky, and Bielozorov the hussar, whom you have seen already. I hope you will be good friends." I was so confused that I did not even bow to any one. In Dr. Lushin I recognised the dark man who had so mercilessly put me to shame in the garden. The others were unknown to me. "'Count,' continued Zinaida, "'write Monsieur Voldemar a ticket. "'That's not fair,' was objected in a slight Polish accent by the Count, a very handsome and fashionably dressed brunette, with expressive brown eyes, a thin little white nose, and delicate little moustaches over a tiny mouth. "'This gentleman has not been playing forfeits with us.' "'It's unfair,' repeated in chorus Bielovzorov and the gentleman described as a retired captain a man of forty, pockmarked to a hideous degree, curly-headed as a negro, round-shouldered, bandy-legged, and dressed in a military coat without epaulettes, worn unbuttoned. "'Write him a ticket, I tell you,' repeated the young princess. "'What's this mutiny? Monsieur Voldemar is with us for the first time, and there are no rules for him yet.' It's no use grumbling. Write it. I wish it." The Count shrugged his shoulders, but bowed submissively, took the pen into his white ring-bedecked fingers, tore off a scrap of paper, and wrote on it. "'At least let us explain to Monsieur Voldemar what we are about,' Lucien began in a sarcastic voice, "'or else he will be quite lost. Do you see, young man, we are playing forfeits. The princess has to pay a forfeit, and the one who draws the lucky lot is to have the privilege of kissing her hand. Do you understand what I have told you?" I simply stared at him, and continued to stand still in bewilderment, while the young princess jumped up on the chair again, and again began waving the hat. They all stretched up to her, and I went after the rest. Meidanov, said the princess to a tall young man with a thin face, little dim-sighted eyes, and exceedingly long black hair. You as a poet ought to be magnanimous, and give up your number to Monsieur Voldemar, so that he may have two chances instead of one. But Meidanov shook his head in refusal, and tossed his hair. After all the others I put my hand into the hat, and unfolded my lot. Heavens! What was my condition when I saw on it the word kiss? Kiss! I could not help crying aloud. Bravo! He has won it! The princess said quickly. How glad I am! She came down from the chair and gave me such a bright, sweet look that my heart bounded. Are you glad? she asked me. Me? I faltered. "'Sell me your lot,' Bielovzorov growled suddenly in my ear. "'I'll give you a hundred roubles.' I answered the hussar with such an indignant look that Zinaida clapped her hands, while Lushin cried, "'He's a fine fellow!' 
"'But as master of the ceremonies,' he went on, "'it's my duty to see that all the rules are kept. "'Monsieur Voldemar, go down on one knee. "'That is our regulation.' Zinaida stood in front of me, her head a little on one side, as though to get a better look at me. She held out her hand to me with dignity. A mist passed before my eyes. I meant to drop on one knee, sank on both, and pressed my lips to Zinaida's fingers so awkwardly that I scratched myself a little with the tip of her nail. "'Well done!' cried Lushin, and helped me to get up. The game of forfeits went on. Zinaida sat me down beside her. She invented all sorts of extraordinary forfeits. She had among other things to represent a statue, and she chose as a pedestal the hideous Nirmatsky, told him to bow down in an arch and bend his head down on his breast. The laughter never paused for an instant. For me, a boy constantly brought up in the seclusion of a dignified manor-house, all this noise and uproar, this unceremonious, almost riotous gaiety, these relations with unknown persons were simply intoxicating. My head went round as though from wine. I began laughing and talking louder than the others, so much so that the old princess, who was sitting in the next room with some sort of clerk from the Tversky gate, invited by her for consultation on business, positively came in to look at me. But I felt so happy that I did not mind anything. I didn't care a straw for anyone's jeers or dubious looks. Zinaida continued to show me a preference, and kept me at her side. In one forfeit I had to sit by her, both hidden under one silk handkerchief. I was to tell her my secret. I remember our two heads being all at once in a warm, half-transparent, fragrant darkness the soft, close brightness of her eyes in the dark, and the burning breath from her parted lips, and the gleam of her teeth and the ends of her hair tickling me and setting me on fire. I was silent. She smiled slyly and mysteriously, and at last whispered to me, "'Well, what is it?' But I merely blushed and laughed, and turned away, catching my breath. We got tired of forfeits. We began to play a game with a string. My God, what were my transports, when, for not paying attention, I got a sharp and vigorous slap on my fingers from her, and how I tried afterwards to pretend that I was absent-minded, and she teased me, and would not touch the hands I held out to her. What didn't we do that evening? We played the piano, and sang and danced and acted a gypsy encampment. Nirmatsky was dressed up as a bear, and made to drink salt water. Count Malevsky showed us several sorts of card tricks, and finished after shuffling the cards by dealing himself all the trumps at whist, on which Lushin had the honour of congratulating him. Meidanov recited portions from his poem, The Manslayer. Romanticism was at its height at this period, which he intended to bring out in a black cover with the title in blood-red letters. They stole the clerk's cap off his knee, and made him dance a Cossack dance by way of ransom for it. They dressed up old Vonifati in a woman's cap, and the young princess put on a man's hat. I could not enumerate all we did. Only Bielovzorov kept more and more in the background, scowling and angry. Sometimes his eyes looked bloodshot, he flushed all over, and it seemed every minute as though he would rush out upon us and scatter us like shavings in all directions. But the young princess would glance at him and shake her finger at him, and he would retire into his corner again. We were quite worn out at last. Even the old princess, though she was ready for anything, as she expressed it, and no noise wearied her, felt tired at last, and longed for peace and quiet. At twelve o'clock at night supper was served. 
consisting of a piece of stale dry cheese and some cold turnovers of minced ham, which seemed to me more delicious than any pastry I had ever tasted. There was only one bottle of wine, and that was a strange one, a dark-coloured bottle with a wide neck, and the wine in it was of a pink hue. No one drank it, however. Tired out and faint with happiness, I left the lodge. At parting, Zinaida pressed my hand warmly, and again smiled mysteriously. The night air was heavy and damp in my heated face. A storm seemed to be gathering. Black storm clouds grew and crept across the sky, their smoky outlines visibly changing. A gust of wind shivered restlessly in the dark trees, and somewhere far away on the horizon muffled thunder angrily muttered as it were to itself. I made my way up to my room by the back stairs. My old man-nurse was asleep on the floor, and I had to step over him. He waked up, saw me, and told me that my mother had again been very angry with me, and had wished to send after me again, but that my father had prevented her. I had never gone to bed without saying good-night to my mother, and asking her blessing. There was no help for it now. I told my man that I would undress and go to bed by myself, and I put out the candle. But I did not undress and did not go to bed. I sat down on a chair and sat a long while as though spellbound. What I was feeling was so new and so sweet. I sat still, hardly looking round and not moving drew slow breaths, and only from time to time laughed silently at some recollection, or turned cold within at the thought that I was in love, that this was she, that this was love. Zinaida's face floated slowly before me in the darkness, floated and did not float away. Her lips still wore the same enigmatic smile. Her eyes watched me, a little from one side, with a questioning, dreamy, tender look, as at the instant of parting from her. At last I got up, walked on tiptoe to my bed, and without undressing laid my head carefully on the pillow, as though I were afraid by an abrupt movement to disturb what filled my soul. I lay down, but did not even close my eyes. Soon I noticed that faint glimmers of light of some sort were thrown continually into the room. I sat up and looked at the window. The window frame could be clearly distinguished from the mysteriously and dimly lighted panes. It is a storm, I thought, and a storm it really was, but it was raging so very far away that the thunder could not be heard only blurred, long, as it were, branching gleams of lightning flashed continually over the sky. It was not flashing, though, so much as quivering and twitching, like the wing of a dying bird. I got up, went to the window, and stood there till morning. The lightning never ceased for an instant. It was what is called among the peasants a sparrow night. I gazed at the dumb, sandy plain, at the dark mass of the Neskuchny gardens, at the yellowish façades of the distant buildings which seemed to quiver too at each faint flash. I gazed and could not turn away. These silent lightning flashes, these gleams, seemed in response to the secret silent fires which were aglow within me. Morning began to dawn. The sky was flushed in patches of crimson. As the sun came nearer, the lightning grew gradually paler and ceased. The quivering gleams were fewer and fewer, and vanished at last, drowned in the sobering positive light of the coming day. And my lightning flashes vanished too. I felt great weariness and peace. But Zinaida's image still floated triumphant over my soul. But it too, this image, seemed more tranquil, 
like a swan rising out of the reeds of a bog, it stood out from the other unbeautiful figures surrounding it, and as I fell asleep I flung myself before it in farewell, trusting adoration. O oh, sweet emotions, gentle harmony, goodness and peace of the softened heart, melting bliss of the first raptures of love, where are they? Where are they? Chapter 8 The next morning, when I came down to tea, my mother scolded me, less severely, however, than I had expected, and made me tell her how I had spent the previous evening. I answered her in few words, omitting many details, and tried to give the most innocent air to everything. Anyway, they're people who are not comme il faut, my mother commented, and you've no business to be hanging about there, instead of preparing yourself for the examination and doing your work. As I was well aware that my mother's anxiety about my studies was confined to these few words, I did not feel it necessary to make any rejoinder. But after morning tea was over, my father took me by the arm, and turning into the garden with me, forced me to tell him all I had seen at the Zasiekins. A curious influence my father had over me, and curious were the relations existing between us. He took hardly any interest in my education, but he never hurt my feelings. He respected my freedom. He treated me, if I may so express it, with courtesy. Only he never let me be really close to him. I loved him, I admired him. He was my ideal of a man, and heavens, how passionately devoted I should have been to him if I had not been continually conscious of his holding me off. But when he liked, he could almost instantaneously, by a single word, a single gesture, call forth an unbounded confidence in him. My soul expanded, I chattered away to him, as to a wise friend, a kindly teacher. Then he as suddenly got rid of me, and again he was keeping me off, gently and affectionately, but still he kept me off. Sometimes he was in high spirits, and then he was ready to romp and frolic with me like a boy. He was fond of vigorous physical exercise of every sort. Once, it never happened a second time, he caressed me with such tenderness that I almost shed tears. But high spirits and tenderness alike vanished completely and what had passed between us gave me nothing to build on for the future. It was as though I had dreamed it all. Sometimes I would scrutinise his clever, handsome, bright face. My heart would throb, and my whole being yearn to him. He would seem to feel what was going on within me, would give me a passing pat on the cheek and go away, or take up some work or suddenly freeze all over, as only he knew how to freeze, and I shrank into myself at once, and turned cold too. His rare fits of friendliness to me were never called forth by my silent but intelligible entreaties. They always occurred unexpectedly. Thinking over my father's character later, I have come to the conclusion that he had no thoughts to spare for me and for family life. His heart was in other things, and found complete satisfaction elsewhere. Take for yourself what you can, and don't be ruled by others. To belong to oneself, the whole savour of life lies in that, he said to me one day. Another time, I, as a young democrat, fell to airing my views on liberty. He was kind, as I used to call it that day, and at such times I could talk to him as I liked. Liberty, he repeated, and do you know what can give a man liberty? What? Will, his own will, and it gives power, which is better than liberty. 
know how to will and you will be free and will lead my father before all and above all desired to live and lived perhaps he had a presentiment that he would not have long to enjoy the savour of life he died at forty-two i described my evening at the zasyekins minutely to my father half attentively half carelessly he listened to me sitting on a garden seat drawing in the sand with his cane now and then he laughed shot bright droll glances at me and spurred me on with short questions and assents at first i could not bring myself even to utter the name of zinaida but i could not restrain myself long and began singing her praises my father still laughed then he grew thoughtful stretched and got up i remembered that as he came out of the house he had ordered his horse to be saddled he was a splendid horseman and long before rary had the secret of breaking in the most vicious horses shall i come with you father i asked no he answered and his face resumed its ordinary expression of friendly indifference go alone if you like and tell the coachman i'm not going he turned his back on me and walked rapidly away i looked after him he disappeared through the gates i saw his hat moving along beside the fence he went into the zasyekins he stayed there not more than an hour but then departed at once for the town and did not return home till evening after dinner i went myself to the zasyekins in the drawing-room i found only the old princess on seeing me she scratched her head under her cap with a knitting needle and suddenly asked me could i copy a petition for her with pleasure i replied sitting down on the edge of a chair only mind and make the letters bigger observed the princess handing me a dirty sheet of paper and couldn't you do it to-day my good sir certainly i will copy it to-day the door of the next room was just opened and in the crack i saw the face of zinaida pale and pensive her hair flung carelessly back she stared at me with big chilly eyes and softly closed the door zina zina called the old lady zinaida made no response i took home the old lady's petition and spent the whole evening over it chapter nine my passion dated from that day i felt at that time i recollect something like what a man must feel on entering the service i had ceased now to be simply a young boy i was in love i have said that my passion dated from that day i might have added that my sufferings too dated from the same day away from zinaida i pined nothing was to my mind everything went wrong with me i spent whole days thinking intensely about her i pined when away but in her presence i was no better off i was jealous i was conscious of my insignificance i was stupidly sulky or stupidly abject and all the same an invincible force drew me to her and i could not help a shudder of delight whenever i stepped through the doorway of her room zinaida guessed at once that i was in love with her and indeed i never even thought of concealing it she amused herself with my passion made a fool of me petted and tormented me there is a sweetness in being the sole source the autocratic and irresponsible cause of the greatest joy and profoundest pain to another and i was like wax in zinaida's hands though indeed i was not the only one in love with her all the men who visited the house were crazy over her and she kept them all in leading strings at her feet it amused her to arouse their hopes and then their fears to turn them round her finger she used to call it knocking their heads together while they never dreamed of offering resistance and eagerly submitted to her 
About her whole being, so full of life and beauty, there was a peculiarly bewitching mixture of slyness and carelessness, of artificiality and simplicity, of composure and frolicsomeness. About everything she did or said, about every action of hers, there clung a delicate, fine charm, in which an individual power was manifest at work. And her face was ever changing, working, too. It expressed, almost at the same time, irony, dreaminess, and passion. Various emotions, delicate and quick-changing as the shadows of clouds on a sunny day of wind, chased one another continually over her lips and eyes. Each of her adorers was necessary to her. Bielovzorov, whom she sometimes called my wild beast, and sometimes simply mine, would gladly have flung himself into the fire for her sake. With little confidence in his intellectual abilities and other qualities, he was for ever offering her marriage, hinting that the others were merely hanging about with no serious intention. Meidanov responded to the poetic fibres of her nature. A man of rather cold temperament, like almost all writers, he forced himself to convince her, and perhaps himself, that he adored her, sang her praises in endless verses, and read them to her with a peculiar enthusiasm, at once affected and sincere. She sympathised with him, and at the same time jeered at him a little. She had no great faith in him, and after listening to his outpourings, she would make him read Pushkin, as she said, to clear the air. Lushin, the ironical doctor, so cynical in words, knew her better than any of them, and loved her more than all, though he abused her to her face and behind her back. She could not help respecting him, but made him smart for it and at times, with a peculiar malignant pleasure, made him feel that he too was at her mercy. I'm a flirt, I'm heartless, I'm an actress in my instincts, she said to him one day in my presence. Well and good, give me your hand then, I'll stick this pin in it. You'll be ashamed of this young man seeing it, it will hurt you. But you'll laugh for all that, you truthful person. Lushin crimsoned, turned away, bit his lips, but ended by submitting his hand. She pricked it, and he did in fact begin to laugh. And she laughed, thrusting the pin in pretty deeply, and peeping into his eyes, which he vainly strove to keep in other directions. I understood least of all the relations existing between Zinaida and Count Malevsky. He was handsome, clever, and adroit, but something equivocal, something false in him was apparent even to me, a boy of sixteen, and I marvelled that Zinaida did not notice it. But possibly she did notice this element of falsity, really, and was not repelled by it. Her irregular education, strange acquaintances and habits, the constant presence of her mother, the poverty and disorder in their house, everything, from the very liberty the young girl enjoyed, with the consciousness of her superiority to the people around her, had developed in her a sort of half-contemptuous carelessness and lack of fastidiousness. At any time anything might happen. Bonifati might announce that there was no sugar, or some revolting scandal would come to her ears, or her guests would fall to quarrelling among themselves. She would only shake her curls and say, What does it matter? and care little enough about it. But my blood, anyway, was sometimes on fire with indignation when Malevsky approached her with a sly, fox-like action, leaned gracefully on the back of her chair, and began whispering in her ear with a self-satisfied and ingratiating little smile, while she folded her arms across her bosom, looked intently at him, and smiled too, and shook her head. "'What induces you to receive Count Malevsky?' I asked her one day. "'He has such pretty moustaches,' 
she answered, but that's rather beyond you. You needn't think I care for him, she said to me another time. No, I don't care for people I have to look down upon. I must have someone who can master me. But merciful heavens, I hope I may never come across anyone like that. I don't want to be caught in anyone's claws, not for anything. You'll never be in love, then. And you, don't I love you? She said, and she flicked me on the nose with the tip of her glove. Yes, Zinaida amused herself hugely at my expense. For three weeks I saw her every day, and what she didn't do with me. She rarely came to see us, and I was not sorry for it. In our house she was transformed into a young lady, a young princess, and I was a little overawed by her. I was afraid of betraying myself before my mother. She had taken a great dislike to Zinaida, and kept a hostile eye upon us. My father I was not so much afraid of. He seemed not to notice me. He talked little to her, but always with special cleverness and significance. I gave up working and reading. I even gave up walking about the neighbourhood and riding my horse. Like a beetle tied by the leg, I moved continually round and round my beloved little lodge. I would gladly have stopped there altogether, it seemed, but that was impossible. My mother scolded me, and sometimes Zinaida herself drove me away. Then I used to shut myself up in my room, or go down to the very end of the garden, and climbing into what was left of a tall stone greenhouse, now in ruins, sit for hours with my legs hanging over the wall that looked on to the road, gazing and gazing, and seeing nothing. White butterflies flitted lazily by me over the dusty nettles. A saucy sparrow settled not far off on the half-crumbling red brickwork, and twittered irritably, incessantly twisting and turning and preening his tail-feathers. The still mistrustful rooks cawed now and then, sitting high, high up on the bare top of a birch-tree. The sun and wind played softly on its pliant branches. The tinkle of the bells of the Don Monastery floated across to me from time to time, peaceful and dreary, while I sat, gazed, listened, and was filled full of a nameless sensation in which all was contained. Sadness and joy and the foretaste of the future, and the desire and dread of life. But at that time I understood nothing of it, and I could have given a name to nothing of all that was passing at random within me, or should have called it all by one name, the name of Zinaida. Zinaida continued to play cat and mouse with me. She flirted with me, and I was all agitation and rapture. Then she would suddenly thrust me away, and I dared not go near her, dared not look at her. I remember she was very cold to me for several days together. I was completely crushed, and, creeping timidly to their lodge, tried to keep close to the old princess, regardless of the circumstance that she was particularly scolding and grumbling just at that time. Her financial affairs had been going badly, and she had already had two explanations with the police officials. One day I was walking in the garden beside the familiar fence, and I caught sight of Zinaida. Leaning on both arms, she was sitting on the grass, not stirring a muscle. I was about to make off cautiously, but she suddenly raised her head and beckoned me imperiously. My heart failed me. I did not understand her at first. She repeated her signal. I promptly jumped over the fence and ran joyfully up to her, but she brought me to a halt with a look, and motioned me to the path two paces from her. In confusion, not knowing what to do, I fell on my knees at the edge of the path. She was so pale. Such bitter suffering, such intense weariness was expressed in every feature of her face. 
that it sent a pang to my heart, and I muttered unconsciously, "'What is the matter?' Zinaida stretched out her head, picked a blade of grass, bit it, and flung it away from her. "'You love me very much?' she asked at last. "'Yes.' I made no answer. Indeed, what need was there to answer? Yes, she said, looking at me as before. That's so. The same eyes, she went on, sank into thought and hid her face in her hands. Everything's grown so loathsome to me, she whispered. I would have gone to the other end of the world first. I can't bear it. I can't get over it. And what is there before me? Ah, oh, I am wretched. My God, how wretched I am! What for? I asked timidly. Zinaida made no answer. She simply shrugged her shoulders. I remained kneeling, gazing at her with intense sadness. Every word she had uttered simply cut me to the heart. At that instant I felt I would gladly have given my life, if only she should not grieve. I gazed at her, and though I could not understand why she was wretched, I vividly pictured to myself how in a fit of insupportable anguish she had suddenly come out into the garden and sunk to the earth as though mown down by a scythe. It was all bright and green about her. The wind was whispering in the leaves of the trees, and swinging now and then a long branch of a raspberry bush over Zinaida's head. There was a sound of the cooing of doves, and the bees hummed, flying low over the scanty grass. Overhead the sun was radiantly blue, while I was so sorrowful. "'Read me some poetry,' said Zinaida in an undertone and she propped herself on her elbow. I like your reading poetry. You read it in sing-song, but that's no matter, that comes of being young. Read me On the Hills of Georgia. Only sit down first. I sat down and read On the Hills of Georgia. That the heart cannot choose but love, repeated Zinaida. That's where poetry's so fine. It tells us what is not, and what's not only better than what is, but much more like the truth. Cannot choose but love. It might not want to, but it can't help it. She was silent again. Then all at once she started and got up. Come along. Meidanov's indoors with Mamma. He brought me his poem. But I deserted him. His feelings are hurt too now. I can't help it. You'll understand it all some day. Only don't be angry with me. Zinaida hurriedly pressed my hand and ran on ahead. We went back into the lodge. Meidanov set to reading us his manslayer, which had just appeared in print, but I did not hear him. He screamed and drawled his four-foot iambic lines. The alternating rhythms jingled like little bells, noisy and meaningless, while I still watched Zinaida, and tried to take in the import of her last words. "'Perchance some unknown rival has surprised and mastered thee,' Maidanov bawled suddenly through his nose, and my eyes and Zinaida's met. She looked down and faintly blushed. I saw her blush and grew cold with terror. I had been jealous before, but only at that instant the idea of her being in love flashed upon my mind. Good God! She is in love! End of chapter 9 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey